Welcome to Slash Forward. In this movie recap, we're going to do a twin study by examining familial relationships from both ends of the spectrum. Conjoined brothers on one side and male-female fraternals on the other, which is really not much different from regular siblings. Of course, this is best explored in the context of the artistic enterprise of recreating waxen torsos. And so we'll be doing this via the 2005 film House of Wax. When a group of kids heading to the big game suffers a vehicular malfunction, they find themselves in a strangely calm town where, it seems, there's more than meets the eye going on. After splitting up into multiple groups, they discover independently that while intricate and ornate wax sculptures can be very interesting to see, they're not as nice to be. So buckle up and keep your eyes halfway closed because this movie gets rougher than I would have expected. Also, be sure to leave a comment about whether you've dismissed this movie for the last 16 years and take a look at some of the other movies featured on the channel. Let's get to it. We open on some icky, sticky goo in 1974 as a master craftsperson prepares a special batch of wax to complete this death mask while also providing a complete and balanced breakfast. But then Papa brings in the naughty one who goes about absolutely wrecking the place, while the parents go about absolutely wrecking his mental state. Flash forward to present day, we know because there's a Deftone song playing, and meet Paige and Carly, a couple of ladies celebrating and laughing raucously. Then Wade slides in real quick to ask his boo why her ex-con brother is coming with them on their road trip to the big game. Frustrated when the topic turns away from her, Paige leaves them to find the attention she craves from Blake. But you never interrupt a man whilst rapping. <laughs> Just playing, he always has time for kissing. Finally, we meet Carly's brother Nick and his bro friend Dalton. Just a couple of shitbags coming on a trip where no one likes them. Dalton's the kind of guy to make you uncomfortable no matter what, and he runs out to the parking lot so the movie can get like super meta. They get a late start with their caravan, which runs at a collective 9 miles per gallon, and with a baffling passenger split. Baffling, that is, until they pull up and see that Paige seems to have dropped her lip balm on Blake's crotch multiple times. But she's a good sport about the whole thing, so good on her. Given the late hour, they opt to pull off a side road and camp out under the stars, which are blind, so that they'll be totally fresh for tomorrow's sports match. The first spot they find happens to be near a house of wax figurines. Despite their desire for morning freshness, the gang gets the second wind and starts footballing. It's revealed that Nick has an arm and is a grumpy turd due to his bitterness at losing his scholarship when he decided to become a career criminal. He has an additional chip on his shoulder about Carly not covering for him when she was questioned about a car she didn't know he stole. As a result, he has fully embraced his perceived role as the evil twin, because they're twins as well. A cool breeze rolls in and brings with it an acrid stench. Their solution is to drink through it and film the resulting wacky shenanigans. But they have to pause the fun when some beer belly rolls up in his truck and refuses to dim his lights, which drives the boys crazy with masculine rage. After a sufficient degree of dick wagging, they do drive the intruder off. After the party settles, we see someone trespassing the campsite and filming the whole gang, but focusing on the ladies. Carly gets a sense that she's being watched, and after failing to get Wade to take it seriously, she ventures out on her own. She's hoping to see a cute baby bear or a barn owl. Instead, she just finds Wade, now outside. They wake up the next day around 2.30 p.m., putting them in a rush to pack up. They face some unforeseen delays in Dalton frantically searching for his missing camera and Wade discovering that his brand new belt has snapped in half. And that's just the boys. Out in the woods, the girls finish watering the garden when they're again hit with that rank waft but they've never met a stench they didn't source, so they venture inland to explore its origination point. Carly finds it pretty quick after sliding down a steep hill into a pit of melty carcasses, including both wildlife and some human remains. They're all overcome with disgust for the natural world when the delivery driver backs in to make a deposit. He is so entranced by the playful dance of bone and sinew that he doesn't even notice the gang until they make themselves known. Upon expressing concern over the content of his meat pit, he puts them at ease by revealing that he values variety in his pit work. It's not all carrion. He also turns out to be an affable young fellow and confirms that there's a service station about 15 miles up the road. Wade insists on going there for a new fan belt so he doesn't have to leave his car out in the wilderness. However, Blake points out that the time it would take to do so may result in them missing the collegiate competition. Wade suggests they head there to secure the tickets while he stays behind. The cordial woodsman offers to give him a ride into town, so Carly decides to stay with him for safety. As a parting gift, Nick bestows his finest tank top upon his little sis, and Cletus soaks him all in like 
Damn, boy, you keeping it tight. The trio then has an awkward drive spent appreciating Carly's shape and discussing the finer points of roadkill collection. Which ones go to the pit and which ones come home, etc. They get to a washout and he exits the car to lock out his hubs, but this change in terrain makes the city folk nervous. They decide to go their own way, offending the sensibilities of their guide. And they immediately regret the offense when they turn the corner to find out he weren't lying about the town. The rest of the group finds themselves stuck in your standard college town cloverleaf traffic jam. With little confidence that they're going to make it in time to catch any part of the game, they elect to turn around and head back. Meanwhile, in Ambrose, they find a functional town just with no one in it. They have the bright idea to seek out assistance in the church where all are welcome, but it's in service. It just so happens that the man who emerges, Bo, is the station attendant. He agrees to hook them up once the burial is complete. Since that's likely to take a couple of hours, they go to kill some time in the House of Wax. They are surprised to discover that even the house portion of the house is also made of wax, and so is basically everything inside, other than those objects for which this doesn't make practical sense, of course. I mean, it's not like they're obsessive weirdos or anything. They marvel at the meticulous detail of the various art pieces and everyday objects. Through their exploration, it's casually revealed that Vincent, the artist in residence, was one of them kids from the opening. Carly catches sight of a watcher in the window, so Wade runs out to see if they've made a new friend. Unfortunately, he doesn't find anyone out there, and some of the less polished pieces start to freak Carly out, sending her a skitterin'. Meanwhile, the boys are doing twin lasers when Blake asks them to circle back for Wade and Carly on their own, because he wants to make time with his lady. In town, they've decided to go belt shopping. Unfortunately, Bo doesn't have what they need. In the shop, that is. He has a 15-incher back at the house, where he sometimes receives deliveries for the shop. Along the way, Bo explains the history of the wax house. Miss Trudy was the main artist, and Vincent was one of her boys. She got a cyst on her brain that made her go cuckoo, and her husband, a surgeon who liked to experiment with interesting procedures he made up on his own, ended up taking his own life. After that, the boys were sent to foster care. At the house, Bo lets Wade in to use the bathroom. While up there, Wade does a little perusing of the various rooms and items therein. Because once invited, why wouldn't he be entitled to roam free and touch everything? He does find a cool room that appears to be set up for amateur gynecology. Outside, Carly has become bored with all this waiting around, so she hops out of the truck. Finally circling around to the front for the first time, she recognizes that this is the truck that menaced them at the campsite. Concerned for Wade's safety, she begins blasting the horn to attract his attention. But before he can react, the lights go out and the door slams shut. Assuming an honest mistake, he begins calling out for help. While distracted with this, a little trapdoor raises up behind him, and the party that emerges gives his Achilles a little snippity snip. He finds this situation both confusing and alarming, and is unable to regain his composure sufficiently to defend himself from repeated stabbings and stompings. Meanwhile, Carly tries to call the others, but Blake has yet to be satiated. Bo comes out with his supplies while she's mid-message, but Carly's not playing games here. She immediately locks herself in and refuses to leave the truck until Wade comes out. Upset about being prevented from the use of his personal property, Bo smashes his way in. Carly manages to reach the pedals and they take off backward down the drive. <laughs> These two are such a pair, but when she gets to the end, she drops off the edge. A callback to the importance of locking out your hubs in advance. Her phone is no longer immediately available, so she cuts her losses, ducks out the back, and takes off down the road. As she searches for cover, she unwittingly gets pretty close to Wade, who's being done up real nice in the cellar of the nearby House of Wax. He has his ouchie sutured and gets a fresh Brazilian for his face. He then gets hooked up to a contraption that completely douches him with hot wax. That machine has gotta be a bitch to clean and unclog. When Carly makes it into town, she learns that the whole place runs on motion detectors. She has the great idea to find sanctuary at the church, but once inside, she learns this to be an entire town of wax, and that beneath the waxy facade are actual human remains. Bo arrives to pay quick respect to his mama and continue his search. Carly does a good job of not whimpering or breathing heavily, but Bo is a natural finder, and he captures her. As the boys arrive at the washout and proceed by foot, Bo takes Carly to his closest Ernie and gives her the Trudy special. But his need to find inspiration through loud rock music attracts the attention of the town's newest tourists. Fortunately for him, Nick is too cool to be searching all over, so they split up to do a mostly ornamental search before heading back. In order to manage this, Bo starts by supergluing her freaking mouth shut and locks her away. Once satisfied his treat is secure, he leaves the basement and is confronted by Nick. 
who finds it somewhat hard to believe that the only service station in town didn't service the two people who came looking for a fan belt. Carly finds a weakness in her lounge chair and attempts to get Nick's attention, but Bo manages to delicately and discreetly prune her pointer finger at the first knuckle. Then, as he convinces Nick to head up with him to the house so they can take a look at his spider collection, Carly says F it and rips her lips open to call out her brother's name. Nick both adeptly avoids taking damage and manages to keep Bo locked out of his own personal property, which we recognize as one of his major pet peeves. Nick then addresses the Carly situation. He did this too. Just now, while you were standing right there, they work on getting out as we transition to Dalton finding his way in. He marvels at the curiosities contained within the house, but is taken aback by a very lifelike rendition of Wade, which actually happens to be alive. He tries to free him from his prison, but it turns out the wax is now his epidermis. Plus, he has more immediate concerns regarding his own general safety. He gets pushed down some stairs, but they're wax, so it doesn't hurt too much. But the follow-up involves being double-daggered in a way that separates his head from his body. That hurts a little more. Meanwhile, they try to figure out a way out of this with no phone and Dalton holding the keys. As Carly insists that everybody is wax, she remembers that one lady, but when they go to peer into her curtain, it's revealed that she's actually a wax and automaton, rather than just an apathetic bystander. Back at the campground, the saucy couple has finally moved on to foreplay. But then the music cuts off, and Blake needs his tunes so he can keep his rhythm. While out there, he brings up his voicemail and hears the truck incident involving Carly. But he never comes back to the tent, so it must have resolved itself, and Paige decides to go to sleep. But her nap is interrupted by the wax man, and she runs out to discover that Blake's outside with a pig sticker stuck in his neck. She sprints off and manages to find a quiet little dungeon to hide in. Unfortunately, she's getting strong signals that her pursuer is in here with her. She runs downstairs in the direction of the stabbing and then attempts to escape by climbing into the backseat of a car and closing her eyes real hard. When she's found, she stabs her attacker in the face one time, but then gives up on that and also forgets to call no tag backs. She then suffers the consequences of not clarifying the rules before the start of the game. Out in the town square, Nick risks discovery in order to upgrade to a crossbow, only to find that Bo is upgraded to a shotgun. They duck into a nearby theater and hide among the figures of the townsfolk. Bo steps up to the stage to get a better view and quickly empties his shotgun while taking a full penetration of the arm. He then makes the mistake of exiting before reloading and finds himself on the business end of a point-blank piercing. In the aftermath, he seems to be unresponsive and has no other shells on him, so they tuck away the firearm and try to sort out their next move while wondering about that Vincent fellow. Nick thinks acquiring her phone is the best move, but it's no longer located in the front of the truck. As an alternative, they decide to venture into the house to see if they can find their friends or call for help. Inside, they find clippings that the boys had been conjoined twins, who were sloppily separated by a dangerous surgery conducted by their father. They're slowed down when Bo returns, hoping to find some ibuprofen in anticipation of slowly sliding a foreign object through his body. A wise choice, as always. While that's going on, they finally get confirmation that there's another living resident in the town and that most of their friend group is deceased. Vincent comes in and starts to refashion his face, while Bo fluffs him up about how proud Mom would be with how close they are to completing her vision. Bo knows they're in the house, but they've managed to sneak away to the upstairs trapdoor, which they use to escape to the workshop. Unfortunately, it's dark and creepy down there, and they mistake circuit breakers for light switches, giving a very clear indication to their location. After getting some light, they do find the most recent work in progress and attempt to free Dalton from his wax in prison. But he does too good of a job. They're then confronted by Vincent and a struggle ensues. Nick tips over the smelting pot to buy them some time. As they escape, they discover that they're the final survivors, allowing them to focus solely on running. But Bo blocks their egress, and now in his weakened state, he is able to give Nick some trouble. An evenly matched physical confrontation ensues as the fire from below erupts into the upstairs and begins to melt the whole place. Things are looking grim, but when Nick takes a knife to the quad, Carly loses it and attempts to ascertain whether Bo knows baseball. Vincent arrives to find the sloppy mess, letting out a soundless yelp before pursuing Carly upstairs, where he opens the door like a room temperature knife through softened butter. As the house reclaims its victims, Carly tries her best to talk him out of his murderous rage, delaying long enough for Nick to arrive and engage in an over-the-covers wrestling match. Amidst this battle of pure strength and will, Carly twists his leg knife a little to free 
free it from its sheath before reinserting it into Vincent. The siblings are then given the unenviable task of trying to figure out how to escape a building that's melting all around them. With some effort, they do manage to squeeze themselves out, like a messy childbirth, as the whole place turns into a giant pot of boiling wax. The next morning finds the town flooded with emergency personnel, attracted to this off-the-map ghost town purely by the tremendous volume of smoke emanating from its location. As they're taken to the ER, we hear the police reveal that local records indicate Trudy Sinclair actually had three boys, and it was that guy from earlier. I'm honestly really surprised that this movie seems to have lukewarm ratings. I thought it was really good. There are certainly some story issues in regards to wasted attempts to build character through small developmental threads that go nowhere, but when it gets to the meaty part of the film, it is quite meaty. The film also goes way harder than I had expected. I remember this movie coming out and being dismissed due to its emphasis on the fact that it features Paris Hilton. Alicia Cuthbert had been in a couple of movies at this point, but maybe they didn't think she could sell a whole movie on her own? There weren't really any other anchors in the cast, so it makes some sense that they focused on the stunt casting for marketing purposes. Despite that, the movie itself is much better than it appears on paper. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.